Paul Salkin, a partner in the Quantum Restructuring and Insolvency team, interviews experts from the Airline Management Group to take an in-depth look at what is happening in the aviation sector, looking at its short-term and long-term prospects. In this video, the team explores the systemic changes for the industry, including what transformations will take place and what the network fleet and capacity will look like. We all have very different skill sets, but they're complementary. But my specific skill set is more around the restructuring, and that tips into using insolvency processes for restructuring as well. And I think a point I've made to you previously um, is that no company has a God-given right to exist and where companies um, have, have shown in the past that they have lacked profitability and that they are not particularly successful businesses, clearly those will be the ones that fail first. Now, whilst that may wipe out shareholder value and that is never the sort of a, a immediate objective, if, if that has happened, of course, that's not to say that you cannot rescue the fundamental trade and the viability of the assets within that business. Sure. So I think certainly part of the picture that we see going forward Yes, there will be shareholder value eroded and wiped out. But if there is demand there from the consumer, starting with the airline industry, to fly around the world, that, of course, then feeds down into the aviation sector generally, then that capacity will be provided by the market and those assets will still be there. So I think that's a really fundamental and an important point. Um, but inevitably, there will be sort of huge structural changes. You, you've talked about the role of the government. I know I can just see questions coming through from delegates. Obviously, that's something that people are really keen to sort of understand. Um, you know, the question of whether or not governments should be bailing businesses out. Um, but I think there's also a really important role for governments. It's more going forward to cr create the right um, sort of strategic and industrial strategies to support industries. That really is the role. If I was to venture an opinion, it's not just to provide immediate liquidity um, mm -hmm. in order to, as the saying goes, to catch a falling knife. It's actually to provide the right conditions um, going forward. And yeah. th there are questions coming through, though, about, you know, for instance, will do we think within the UK um, and elsewhere within the Eurozone, in fact, globally, will smaller regional airports have to close, for instance? Is, I don't know who wants to take that question. Well, I, 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 I could answer. I think that question, um, there are two parts. In the short term, uh, the, all airports face problems, whether they're small regional ones or larger regional ones. We know from uh, passenger surveys and from the reality of the controls that exist on travel that domestic travel will grow faster than long-haul international travel. So if your small regional airport is serving a domestic market, whether it's in France or, or the UK or in China, they will survive. They won't close. But if it is serving an international market, then your ability to survive will be much more a long-term issue whether you can get through and survive the next two or three years before international travel picks up. Yeah. Augusto, you're a strategist and a planner, um, and you know, you've worked across the aviation sector for a long time now. Um, talk us through um, how you think the overall supply chain will adapt and react to the sort of the, pr the present um, situation. Um, have you got any thoughts on that? I mean, if, we, if we're looking at the, at the picture at the moment, we're probably looking at the tip of the iceberg. It's the, it's the, immediate, it's the immediate effect. It's the, it's the airline, which is like the first point of contact with the customer who is prevented from flying from the, from the immediate situation. But, it's it's just like a tip. This will this will filter filter up uh, the chain as uh, uh, as time goes on and as uh, as some of the problems are passed on to uh, onto suppliers and they will start like feeling it uh, more and more as the um, as the effect gets more and more prolonged. So we will see undoubtedly effects on uh, on the OEMs on the on the 
um, suppliers, on the on the ground handling companies, on the airports, on on the entire supply chain that we um, that the airline industry works with. Uh, some of it will be caused by airlines and subsequent steps in the chain, like passing, let's say, like passing the parcel up uh, as as far as they can. Um, and uh, at a certain point, like the uh, uh, the parcel will have to stop, uh, and there will be severe consequences for uh, for a lot of the players that will be um, that will be felt. And I think inevitably, one one of the things that I, I can see happening and. Um, I, I think we've also had some preliminary discussions about this. I mean, certainly from the consumer's point of view, there is a risk that there will be um, a, a contraction in the amount of choice available um, on, on you know, certain routes, for instance. Yeah. And that sort of reduction in the competitive environment will also be part of the story on pricing. So I think we're probably looking um, at a... Um, particularly sort of for the, for the airline sector in particular for the passenger, a more expensive product going forward um, if, if airlines are looking to sort of maintain and sustain profitability. P- Peter, your thoughts on that? Well, just, just that I think, I think uh, coming back with my, my optimistic hat on, uh, well, realistic hat, I hope, is, is that this, I believe, uh, is and should be taken as an opportunity for the global airline industry to, to reset itself. Uh, and, and take advantage uh, or and, and if an airline goes uh, uh, in, into bankruptcy, clearly that, that's uh, not a desirable. It affects obviously the employees uh, of that organisation plus uh, the capability strategically or otherwise of uh, making connections between other airports. But one of the great things about the airline industry, and I, I have to say, having been involved in it for a long time, uh, we, we, we don't pat ourselves on the back, but certainly I think, and perhaps it's now a dirty word, uh, the, the impact on globalization, I don't think could have been accelerated uh, if the airline industry had, had uh, not been in, in place with the current structure. Now you can have a debate about that as to whether that's a, a good or bad thing. And I say that deliberately to provoke uh, some questions, but, but nonetheless, it is a fact and, and that's what's happened. So I, I, I think you know, the, the, uh, it's a very, as I said, competitive, some pretty clever people in the airline industry. And when we reset, the marketplace will be there. It's a question of how long does it come back and, and when it comes back, uh, in what chunks does it come back? But I, I believe that the airline industry, whoever that happens to be at the time, whether it be the existing carriers or new carriers, and there will be new carriers that come out of this, uh, then the opportunity to fly from A to B at a pretty competitive price uh, will come back onto the uh, on, onto the you know, consumer's opportunity. The Peter, question, Peter, I think, I, th- I think there's an- another issue, if I, if I may, and yeah. you you touch on it, and it touches on what Riga said as well. I think the cost of flying is going to change. Okay, yeah. and I think yes. it will change for a variety of reasons. I think we also have to be very clear as you are, and you know I'm more on the bearish side than the optimistic side, and I'm told to be a little more optimistic from times. I see myself as a realist. We have this massive dislocation at the moment, and there's one question that's just come up, which uh, we have seen, and I'm sure we're, we're all talking about it. It's how do those who supply the airlines have to adjust now and, and perhaps reinvent themselves? And for all businesses, or to a greater degree, it's almost along the lines of the co- comments that... Um, uh, Ricard Gustafson of SAS said, and he said it in the case of the airline, there is no travel, therefore there is no economic case for an airline. That gave him that cover to say, well, I'm going to cut, perhaps cut my employment by 50%. All, we can do all the modelling in the world we like, and we all do it, and we can take a view of the assumptions. And I think, and I hope the advantage we have over some is their experience, and we're realistic in the assumptions we make. This yeah. is going to be a smaller business. We have lost the summer this period. Um, costs are going to go up. We know the dislocation. Yes, you can get, you'll be able to get airplanes cheaply and you'll have new challenges come in. We'll have some of the legacy carriers focus very inwardly, as we saw after 9-11 and after we saw the great financial crisis. And that creates a vacuum for others to accelerate past. So that's an opportunity. But given the requirements that customers will or passengers will now demand about the airplane being absolutely clean, 
uh, and we can talk about social distancing on airplanes or whatever and whether the airflow is enough to keep you safe it may or may not be there's going to be a huge continuing debate about that but the reality is if i want my airplane to be cleaned and demonstrably cleaned at the end of each flight you can't do a 25 minute you can't do a 30 minute turnaround so the efficiency of the system declines what you've also got you look at how an airline and you've looked at this we've all looked at it how you're going to restart your network at the moment you are retaining that capability to restart michael o'leary he said he's going to get i'm going to go back at 40% willie walsh in front of a transport committee here said we were going to start meaningfully until the, uh, the, uh, the until the, the quarantine came in you can model it we've modeled it you look at it and say okay instead of flying eight times a day initially to new york i fly two times a day and everywhere i flew multiple times long haul i probably just fly twice and talk cuz i'm going to focus on that core business where uh, i make money and we're going to move away from what was a supply side driven industry where the capacity came in financing was cheap uh, it became the airline's problem and they convinced themselves they made money um they might not even made a reasonable contribution and it's the thing we you and I have debated many times the have metal will fly strategy that is a thing of yesterday and with it have gone fares and regus is absolutely right in the domestic bubble uh, you're going regional airports which have only been domestic will be okay it's those that are relied upon the international one where it's not going to happen anymore although short haul will come back more quickly than long haul that we have to look at the dislocation and we have to model it all and we life is about options and we look at the options there are and we reserve that ability to be able to respond but i think travel the cost of travel will go up capacity and we can see it we can see how many large airplanes have been retired we can see how on long haul it's not about filling the 380 there are five 380s flying at the moment one of which is owned by airbus and then you move into the right part of the yield curve and yes it sort of helps as well so there's a long way back but you're right demand will be there um and uh the economics and confidence are the two key things that are going to provide that kicker to it and so that can I can I make a comment uh Chris said demand will be there demand is there now but it's locked so the key issue for airlines and airports is how do you unlock the demand that's passenger confidence regis we know it's not just confidence confidence is one element of it we know that the as a result of the corona virus uh the governments have shut down mm-hmm. travel effects mm-hmm. and to open it you have to have as i think somebody at crispy mentioned you have to have some kind of health protocol mm-hmm. we know that ikeo the international uh, the un uh, aviation Ed- agency has a task force called the covid aviation recovery task force it has promised to produce health protocols by the end of this month covering the air crew the passengers the uh and cargo the the aircraft itself and the airports so we hope that by the end of this year we at end of this month we will have a protocol now the question is how long will it take to be approved by the different governments and then how long will it take to be implemented iata has produced recommendations for the immediate future in the longer term we know that we after perhaps the middle of next year we will have a a, a, a passport a health passport as we used to have with smallpox and other illnesses 30 or 40 years ago in the short term we will have temperature checks at airports before people perhaps get into the airport this is what iata has advised we will have uh, less contact at the airport which means uh, no um, no check in or bag handling uh, contact we will have cleaning of the aircraft which you mentioned uh, as frequently as possible mm-hmm. face masks simplified uh, catering Uh, distancing when people get on and off the airport mm. how do you achieve all this and maintain the viability mm. uh, of the industry yeah, but, absolutely agree but the, the but what we can see is that in the short term the unlocking will not mm. come fast enough look out for the next three parts in this series on the quantum and airline management group's linkedin channels and websites